Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's session, um, including the three topics that are grippingly placed together, religion, racism, and populism. I'm Katie Lofton. I chair the Department of Religious Studies here. I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists in the order of uh, their, their speaking order, and then I'm going to invite them to go up to the podium to do their talk, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A afterwards, which I'll moderate. So our first speaker today is Edouard Schipoli, who has his own PhD in political science and international relations and is a visiting scholar at the Prince Alouette bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University. He's also a contributor at Huffington Post. He works as the <coughs> program director at the Federation of Balkan American Associations in New Jersey and also the CEO of Istanbul Leadership Institute in Istanbul, Turkey. Today, Edwan will be speaking to us about securitization of religion in post-Cold War America. Our second speaker, Arvind Rajagopal, is a professor in media studies and an affiliate faculty in sociology and in social and cultural analysis at NYU. In 2003, his book, Politics After Television, Hindu Nationalism and the Reshaping of the Public in India, won the Kumaraswani Prize from the Association of Asian Studies. In addition to his scholarly publications, Arvind has also written in the press, most recently in the Los Angeles Review of Books and in the Hindu the newspaper in India. His current work is on media theory as a casualty of Cold War history for a book currently under contract with Duke. And our final speaker, I'm sorry, and uh, Arvind will be speaking to us on the subject of religious populism and communism's afterlife, thinking through the long half century of the Cold War. And our final speaker, Federico Finkelstein, is a professor of history at the New School for Social Research in Eugene Lane College. Professor Finkelstein is the author of five books on fascism, populism, dirty wars, the Holocaust, and Jewish history in Latin America and Europe. His new book is From Fascism to Populism in History from the University of California Press. That is coming out this month. Um, and he'll be speaking to us today on populism, racism, and anti-Semitism in history. So uh, please join me in welcoming these speakers and just launch us into physical action. Uh, that, so this works right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a, a great conference so far. Uh, it's been so good that now we're uh, some of us are thinking. So what's the perky? You know, what, when something's going to happen? But hopefully everything is going well. Uh, but uh, speaking at, at this time is a little bit tricky. Uh, first is that very distinguished speakers said uh, great things that. Uh, you know, you might uh, have thought of saying, like I've thought of saying some things, but uh, it has been covered. But also, uh, I learned a lot from this conference that are going, uh, that are related to uh, my, my, my talk. And it's, uh, it's mostly that Cold War is, the Cold War mentality is still continuing uh, in, in the post-Cold War uh, America, and that is what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, I know we just had lunch, if you are sleepy, continue. I'll make sure I'll shout before I finish, and you can just wake up and clap, and that would be all. Um, so I, I worked on the securitization of Islam in US foreign policy, uh, basically on how Islam became a security issue uh, in America and what were its implications. But uh, with I, I basically. Uh, analyzed uh, Clinton, Bush, and, uh, and Obama administrations. But with the coming of the new administration, I see that, in fact, it hasn't been only um, Islam that has been securitized. Religion and how religion has uh, been embedded in the security atmosphere is important. And today, uh, today and yesterday, we saw that in this security atmosphere, you can uh, take off Muslims, you can put others, or even non-religious uh, immigrants or, or someone like that. But first of all, just for the ones that uh, are, might not be familiar with the securitization theory, so the theory that I work is, uh, there are three types of uh, methods how you deal with uh, an issue. The non-politization, which is constructing that issue as not important uh, for the public. This politicization is bringing that issue to the, uh, to the public to discuss it. Uh, and securitization, meaning that uh, that is an existential, very important 
issue that uh, the high level politics should deal with it uh, with all the means. Otherwise, uh, it's so important that uh, if we don't deal with that issue immediately, we might not be able to, do, to deal with it uh, afterwards. So Islam, in a, in a kind of way, being a social issue or mostly a, a political issue, uh, because you know, we speak of uh, Muslim votes and, and stuff like, or like the issues of the Muslim minorities. Uh, but in America, especially after 9-11, after uh, we see our, uh, Islam being approached from a security uh, perspective. So, of course, the securitization theory has its own building blocks, which is that you must have a threat, you must have a referent object, you must make a, a, a speech act, and uh, all of things. But uh, those, um, uh, my book on, uh, on Islam, uh, Islam, Securitization and U.S. Foreign Policy will be published next week by, by Pelgrave Macmillan. So, buy the book or something, I don't know. <laughs> but, so there I explain more about securitization theory because it's relatively a, a newer theory from basically from 1997 on. Uh, now, Cold War is also another element that uh, is important for uh, for the speech, and it's in the uh, in um, the title. So, Cold War is very important because in American politics, uh, Cold War uh, has raised a a generation of experts, a generation of policy policy makers that have worked on that issue for 40 years. So, basically. That is, the, uh, that is an important mentality in the U.S. policy making. It's the bread and butter of the U.S. foreign policy. And uh, after, after the Cold War, we see that a lot of, of discourse or a lot of Cold War rhetoric has been transformed. Nevertheless, while the, the main issue in the Cold War was that there is a Soviet Union, Russia, and we as America are opposite to what Russia is, or what Soviet is. After the Cold War, when Soviet other is not so prominent, we as experts, or Cold War experts, whoever they are, remain there. And that mentality remained there. Now, uh, finally, religion. Uh, uh, religion has been something that the American politicians have always tangled with. Uh, so they've, they've dealt with religion uh, from time to time whenever they needed to, to legitimize something. But it basically, uh, most of the time, it did not escalate to being a security issue. For example, um, I mean, this was even during uh, the Cold War. But uh, afterwards, for example, when, uh, when uh, President Clinton uh, had, to uh, had to deal with uh, security threats, or even uh, intervening in two Muslim majority uh, countries, or at least like Kosovo is Muslim majority, but uh, Bosnia, Bosnians are Muslims. Uh, when he and his administration needed to intervene, they didn't uh, really use the religious discourse in, in their security issues. It was more about human rights, about, about uh, genocide and ethnic cleansing and, and stuff like that. So uh, I say that Clinton has wisely rejected uh, claims that, uh, uh, that Islam, in, in this case, is different from, uh, from what America stands and, and stuff like that. And, uh, when the Oklahoma uh, bombings happened, uh, many commentators uh, thought that this was an Islamic jihadist uh, attack, uh, whereas from the beginning, uh, President Clinton has rejected uh, such claims, and then it turned out that it was not the case anyway. And then we come to the, uh, to the presidency of, of George Bush. Now, uh, w I want to speak as much as I can for religion in general, but my research was on, on Islam, and uh, I'm sure that after, uh, after this, I'll enter uh, much more into research on um, religion in general. But so today I will make many references to how Islam was securitized, especially during the, uh, the George Bush administration. So um, the president, uh, uh, President Bush, uh, whenever, um, I mean, he 
talked about Islam in most of his security speeches. I, my, uh, part of my, uh, what I was doing is um, uh, analyzing his, his speeches uh, that deal with security, uh, and in most of them, uh, he uh, talked about, um, uh, about Islam. So, uh, and of course, Islam uh, was associated with security keywords, uh, although not directly uh, accused Association with, keyword, with security keywords in a religionized security atmosphere that he and his, in his administration constructed has securitized Islam. What Bush and his administration did is that they first con uh, uh, constructed a security atmosphere. Then they gave the security atmosphere a religious scent by calling it a crusade. And in this crusade, of course, it, when the security atmosphere was constructed, it was easier to put any religion, in this case Islam, inside of it by uh, constructing it as the other, associated with it with security words, uh, keywords, and then uh, anti-Islam sentiments and Islamophobia have skyrocketed. Well, this is, of course, not new in America because uh, uh, the, the Jewish community, uh, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, Africans, gypsies, homosexuals, and many others have fit in this category at different times. For Bush, it was Islam and, and Muslims, but this does not mean that it would stay like that when it was always like that. So how um, security is, is, uh, is maybe one of the most um, uh, secular institutions, because it's security, it's very important. Nevertheless, uh, during the Bush administration, security has been um, re religionized. So the security of, the Amer of America has been, cons uh, has been associated with, um, with religion during the Bush administration. Uh, I, I always thought of, you know, securitization of religion, where then a professor, a professor of mine, uh, just so I can mention him, so that uh, it's not plagiarism or something, because he didn't, he didn't really publish anything about that. He said that, in fact, it was John Vole. He said, uh, and it made a lot of sense, that uh, it was security that was religionized. It was security that became a, a religious issue, of, and. Uh, because Bush has never refrained from proudly expressing his religious views and devotion. Uh, for example, in, in many occasions, he talked about uh, how he found, found life after becoming a devout Christian. He proudly claimed the credit of deciding to start a faith-based organization for prisons to spread the gospel, uh, the gospel while, while president. He quoted Christian religious scripts for the war of apocalypse to, Jean, uh, to Jacques Chirac. He claimed that his idol is Jesus in his memoir and that, and that the story of Moses in the Bible is the story that made him run for president. He also believed in a religious mission, claiming that the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq and the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace deal were calls from God. Of course, finally, which, which made it very clear, is that he did not refrain from using the word crusade to explain American war in the Middle East. And uh, in this case, uh, he did not have to mention Islam as the other, but uh, leaving Islam out of, any, of everything that America stands for as us, constructed Islam as the other, where Islam has become a security concern, especially after it was associated with keywords in the same species. So another thing, uh, uh, for example, when also he was uh, talking about Islamic extremism or radicalism, the most references that he made were uh, references to um, events that America has already won, either uh, Saddam Hussein or, um, uh, or Cold War. So uh, he defined 9-11 attacks in front of the Congress nine days after the attacks as we have seen their kind before, uh, they are the hairs of all the m uh, murderous ideologies of the 20th century. They follow the path of fascism, Nazism, and, and totalitarianism. And he also, um, 
he also compared 9-11 con uh, continuously with the Pearl Harbor attacks. In his uh, autobiography, he gives a reference to the fall of Kandahar, uh, and he says that it's interesting how Kandahar felt on December 5th, which is the 16th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. So what I'm trying to explain here is that that, uh, that mentality has continued afterwards, and this is, uh, and th the problem is that we could not go out of that mentality. Um, so, of course, it's, easy, it's diffi very difficult to expect less uh, from, uh, from uh, President Bush and his administration because um, his senior, uh, senior advisors and um, uh, decision makers in the administration were, most of them were Cold War actors. Uh, no one else but Condoleezza Rice was his, uh, was his uh, teacher and, uh, on, on, uh, and then national security uh, advisor, but then Powell, uh, Cheney, Rumsfeld, they all came from, uh, from Father Bush and um, even uh, Cheney in his memoir, he says that, uh, that uh, Bush should have, uh, should have finished what his father uh, couldn't. So, um, if, if we go back to the uh, to the uh, to the religion the religion of, of security, um, Bush was very serious when he talked about the crusade in the Middle East, because uh, he claimed that uh, in, uh, in in a meeting with the Israeli and Palestinian uh, delegation, he claimed that. Uh, uh, that he got a call from God and that all he's doing is answering the call from God in Afghanistan, Iraq, and to make a peace deal uh, between Israel and, and Palestine, which I hoped, I wished that would have gone through that call, but unfortunately we still have that problem. Nevertheless, when talking to Jacques Chirac of France, um, uh, Bush used religious discourse to convince Chirac, and uh, I want to quote Jacques, Jacques, you and I share a common faith. You're a Roman Catholic, I'm a, Methodist, I'm a Methodist. But we are both Christians committed to the teachings of the Bible. We share one common Lord. Gog and Magog are at work in the Middle East. Big biblical prophecies are being fulfilled. This confrontation is willed by God, who wants to use this conflict to erase his people's enemies before a new age begins. So, uh, the the the, uh, the apocalyptic war and uh, where where Gog and Magog is uh, is mentioned uh, is uh, obviously in, in in both Old and New Testament is the apocalyptic war. In fact, how I found this was when I was uh, uh, searching in Google about a uh, uh, Bin Laden uh, co uh, quote about uh, why they are against, uh, uh, like America is against us and stuff like that. This is something that came out. I was like, well, you know, things happen. Anyway, so um, why are we talking uh, so much about, uh, about this and why this is important? Well, uh, I believe that the securitization of, uh, of Islam uh, in particular and religion in general has a big impact in today's events. Uh, the security atmosphere was constructed and this is done by mainly three things. Fear, more fear, and much more fear. By inflicting fear, one can do many things, as best explained by uh, George uh, Falconer of a single man film. Fear, after all, is our real enemy. Fear is taking over our world. Fear is being used as a tool of manipulation in our society. It's how politicians uh, peddle policy and how Madison Avenue sells us things we don't need. Think about it. Fear that we are going to be attacked Fear that there are communists lurking around every corner. Fear that some little Caribbean country that doesn't believe in our way of life poses a threat to us. Fear that black culture may take over the world. Fear of growing old and being alone." End of quote. When we come back, uh, when we come to President Obama, uh, uh, the, the Obama administration have um, have an, uh, acknowledged that this was a wrong policy to, to securitize religion or Islam in particular. 
And although they have, uh, as an administration, has tried to desecuritize religion, in this case Islam, it has not been very uh, successful. Of course, we cannot expect that something that has been, uh, uh, that has, has done so much damage in eight years cannot be meant in another eight years, but also the, uh, uh, the acts were a little bit like, uh, like superficial. Uh, and finally, uh, we come uh, to President Trump, which uh, I wish I, finished, I had finished my book before the, uh, the, the new president, because I had to deal with uh, looking at speeches that President Trump has made on security and Islam, so meaning all the speeches, uh, before he became uh, the president. Before his inauguration, everything that whatever, um, whatever progress has done during the Obama administration have, have gone to waste, of course. But there is something, uh, there's something interesting. And this is that until now, uh, until the Trump administration, Islam was not securitized or attacked directly. It was, a, it was attacked or securitized uh, by association, indirectly, which is what, uh, uh, what, what, what David Hirsch today talked uh, talk in the morning, that today anti-Semitism in, in America is not very explicit. It was like anti-Muslim sentiment, sentiments were during the Bush administration. What changed is now uh, people like General Flynn ask uh, Americans to share his tweet about, uh, about uh, the fear against Islam being rational. So the anti-Muslim sentiments have gone in an action level, whereas uh, the anti-Semitism anti now has um, kind of come to the place where, where the anti-Muslim sentiments were, were uh, during the Bush administration, not explicitly talking uh, against it, um, talking, uh, talking against it. Moreover, uh, as, as, as we can see in, uh, in, in most of the statements of the, of the Trump administration, Islam today is not accepted by them as a religion. It's accepted as an ideology. First, it does not enter into the constitutional uh, right of religion. Second, is because uh, um, they have a need to define America and American fight against another ideology, just like the Cold War a foreign ideology. Uh, I don't need to quote uh, the Trump administration in, his, in, their, uh, in what they said, of course, uh, against Islam, because as we all know, they, uh, they come from, I think, Islam hates us, to uh, Islam being um, a cancer that General Flynn said. Uh, what I want to finish with is that today we must say that everyone has in one way or another contributed to this security atmosphere. But most importantly, it is very, it, it's scary and it should scare us all. In this atmosphere, it will be easier to substitute one constructed threat with another. It will be easy to substitute Muslims with Jews or substitute Muslims with religious people, immigrants, non-whites, or others. This atmosphere makes people vulnerable to conspiracy theories which today have become mainstream. Bush has not attacked Islam or the Muslims explicitly, by, but by association. Today, the anti-Muslim campaign has evolved into action level, uh, being attacked openly and directly. Anti-Semitism has taken anti-Muslim and anti-Islam's place by being attacked by association, conspiracies, and, and uh, sometimes explicitly. I guess hate has also some evolving levels. Despite the firing or resignation of Bannon and Gorka, the nationalist idealism is safe and firm in the administration, but more so in the discourse among people. Now, just to, uh, before I, uh, before I, before I, uh, I finish, I want to finish with a quote that, uh, that uh, the Professor Austin uh, yesterday read from Hater 301. Uh, when talking, uh, when asked about Obama, uh, this hater 301 said that he's a communist dictator, wannabe. So I guess he couldn't even become a real dictator, he's only a wannabe. 
who has no respect for God, our history, our, consti our constitution, our freedoms, our culture, our borders, our military, our tax money, Israel, or the truth. Also, he is a pro-terrorist, Muslim, anti-colonialist, with an animus uh, toward whites in general and American whites in particular. He has no love uh, for this country or its people. He is a man to be feared and not respected. So, basically, anyone can fit in, uh, can be constructed as, as one of uh, uh, being in, in one of these categories. So. Uh, of course, there is nothing good in this, in this uh, security and political climate, but at least we understand that conferences like this are necessary where we deal with racism, anti-Semitism, anti, anti all as a common question. Anti-Semitism is not uh, separate from, uh, uh, from Islamophobia or other type of racism. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I hope thank you, everybody. I don't know how much time we have. I'll just launch into my talk. Uh, I understand the title of a talk is always a contract about what I ought to say, but uh, like many contracts, I will honor it to the best of my ability, but uh, um, <clears throat> there's some deviation here. Now, the upending of conventional assumptions by recent events is so numerous and so far-reaching that retaining the academic high ground of detached contemplation is not easy. One has to resort to what Bertolt Brecht has called in a time that was in some respects like our own, plumpus denken, clumsy thinking, in the effort to understand the links rapidly being drawn across realms we are not used to thinking across very easily, race, religion, and government, for example. Like a blitzkrieg that takes the political establishment by surprise, the religious and racial supremacism currently ascendant in many societies claims to effect something like a transvaluation of existing official values. And meanwhile, there is the risk of responding in predictable ways, feeding into an existing plan of action, but one that actually belongs to the opposition. Here I'm responding to the call of this conference as someone who spent many years studying Hindu nationalism in India, and second, more important for our conference, perhaps as a scholar of media history. In the 19th century, print technology, together with upper-class reaction to socialist and communist movements, which gained from the speed of the telegraph and the railway, led to the spread of racialized theories of history from Western Europe, from thinkers like Gobineau and Boulainvilliers. The uptake of race theory in colonial regions such as India by thinkers such as Bal Gangadhar Tilak can be seen in his 1903 volume, The Arctic Home of the Vedas, dedicated to Max Muller, where he reads the Hindu scriptures to argue that Aryans actually originated from the Arctic regions and migrated outwards from there, mainly to India and incidentally to Europe. This was the earliest expression of what later became Hindu nationalism. And here the author denies colonial difference and instead <coughs> implies that India's culture predates that of Europe. These are claims that resonated with later racial thinkers, such as René Guignon and Julius Evola, who cite Tillock, amongst others. Steve Bannon also invokes Hindu theories of cyclical time, arguing that we are in the Kali Yuga, the end times, according to the Hindu cosmology, before the world is overcome by sin, destroyed by the gods, and has to be created anew. According to this model of thinking, whatever was first should always remain first, and whatever comes later should always be subordinate. You may say this is a kind of aristocratic thinking, which responds to the Christian messianism of working class movements from below. We could say it's a kind of anti-media theory, rejecting the patent influence of new technologies which allow an inversion of hierarchy and offer, therefore, advantages to latecomers. 
these advantages have in fact constituted key premises of modernization and constitute its revolutionary elements such as they are. There is a well-established tendency in intellectual historiography to discern continuities and shifts in the way ideas pass down through the ages. But here I would like to forefront the social and technical mechanisms of transmission and circulation, whose importance has grown, while scholarship has often continued to treat them as invisible props, as if ideas could go forth and multiply by themselves, as if media were simply vanishing mediators. The knowledge that this is not so is increasingly hard to ignore. The issue is how to understand it. It is clear that right-wing groups see media technologies as a double gift, at least. On the one hand, reducing the expense of grassroots mobilization, and second, utilizing liberal protections to propagate hate and violence under the guise of free speech. It is inconceivable, I suggest, that the rapid rise of these groups could have occurred without it <coughs> across the world. Here I can reference recent Hindu nationalism, which has moved from a fringe political phenomenon to a party that is not only politically dominant, but also socially and culturally. And this has occurred in the space of a few decades, about three. And that too in a country that continues to be regarded as a rare example of capitalism's triumph in the global south. For example, India has a relatively large middle class, a record of peaceful electoral change that is probably unique amongst developing countries, and a growth rate that for many years now has been far higher than that of the developed north. But together with rapidly rising inequality, hate crime and political violence against Muslims and Dalits, formerly untouchable castes, have increased. A recent Pew Research Center analysis of 198 countries ranked India as the fourth worst for social hostility based on religion behind only Syria, Nigeria, and Iraq. Now, the US Republican Party has provided the Hindu Nationalist Party, the BJP, with a role model in combining neoliberal and socially conservative policies. But India leads the US by some decades in providing a model where independent media coverage and electoral democracy have repeatedly meshed together in extremely violent forms of politics while formally retaining the rule of law. Over the past three decades, we are witnessing in India the practice, the socialization of the public into the practice of cruelty, staged by vigilante, as vigilante violence. We have lynchings, uh, this extends to the, uh, the riots that brought the current prime minister to, to office. But more recently, we have lynchings and public humiliation of Dalits and Muslims by Hindu nationalists recorded on camera that go viral on social media. This would be followed by lengthy silence on the part of political leaders. And instead of punishment, perpetrators are rewarded with gifts, social and political privileges and they become local leaders and media stars. This is counter-revolution at work, with violence and criminality in the service of moribund hierarchy being installed at the head of society instead of being corrected in any way. Counter-revolution not only in the assertion that violence belongs at the center of modern civilization instead of being eliminated from it, as for example Norbert Elias has argued, but also in rejecting reason and transparency as being rules of public discourse. Instead, we are referred to abstract knowledge that justifies violence, justifications at a higher level that do not have to be spelt out, available to the initiated, that sanctions collective punishment in response to, in response to allegations of an individual infraction. Perhaps we have taken so much for granted that progress is inevitable and that modern institutions are at the service of progress that when these institutions suddenly reverse the direction of their movement, we are completely at a loss and then can only protest that this was never the plan. And it's possible that with events like Charlottesville, we are seeing exactly this model of political action at work. 
To summarize my argument in brief, and then I'll spell out some comparisons, drawing on the example of Hindu nationalism as well. Reinhard Koselleck has observed that concepts emerge within and in response to specific polemics arising in history. We may still be too close to the polemics involved with media as a concept to clarify it adequately, but we notice the terms shifting and indeterminate lexical character. Is it singular, as in the media says, or is it a collective noun, as in Friedrich Kittler's uh, uh, well-known quotation, media determine our situation, are media actors or merely objects? The term exists in each of these senses, often within the same work. Historical semantics tells us to pay attention when a word acquires new kinds of usage. <clears throat> Historical change may manifest as disregard for etymology and grammatical consistency and only later acquire intellectual elaboration. At a time when received eschatology is overshadowed by human-made disasters and when technique and instrumentality often replace older concerns of good and evil, the prominence of the word media, together with its conceptual vacuity, illuminates, I suggest, the insurgent political energies we observe today with their free-floating and protean character. Their violence is obviously what gets attention, but it may distract from broader historical understanding. We can recall that the conclusion of the Cold War, of the Cold War era, led to triumphal predictions about the end of history. In fact, the moment marked an end to mass utopias. Susan Buck Morse has argued this, for example, <coughs> that with the, uh, of, that is, the end of the widespread belief in collective emancipation fostered by technologies of the modern state. As practices and technologies of abstraction and mediation have proliferated over the 19th and 20th century, however, they also generated their opposites, the sense of an unmediated relation to the benefits of modernity and of alternative forms of belonging. We could say that utopias have continued to emerge, disparate and mutually irreconcilable, progressive and regressive both. Given scholarly preoccupation with the high politics of the state, they have not gained much scrutiny until they have become violent, perhaps. Extinguishing the specter of communism may have led to the failure of the illusion named communism, but the specter of unmediated collectivity is alive and well, and both the passionate energy and the enormous naivety of those subscribing to such collectivities is in part a result of the way in which the Cold War was fought and won, I suggest. And here I have a line from the poet John Ashbery, forget as we will, something soon comes to stand in their place. Not the truth, perhaps, but yourself. It is you who made this, but the truth has passed on to divide us all. Close quote. So my argument is working through three categories, Cold War, media, and religion. I've introduced each of them. I'll say a bit more about them now. Now, to invoke the Cold War is, is liable to put most audiences on guard, in part because the scholarship was conducted by experts who never predicted its end. But very briefly, if the aim of the Cold War was to fight communism, religion was regarded as a benign ally in that war and as a realm of morality divorced from politics and capable of judging it, deepening a long-standing contradiction that undercut the division between private and public, over time leading to its increasing importance in the public sphere. In Cold War language, this is what is known as blowback. And we've seen it in many places, from the Middle East to South Asia to the United States itself. State Department reports on the Hindu right-wing organization that Narendra Modi, present Prime Minister of India, and other leaders of the present government are members of. Such reports on the Hindu right-wing organization over the 50s and 1960s repeatedly argued that it was a harmless group focused on religious faith, in fact, on Hindu revival. They failed to notice that this organization actually avoided all symbols and rituals of Hindu faith, 
And in any case, Hindus, Hindu faith did not read, need revival. It was alive and well. Interestingly, there was no linking back to these older reports when large-scale violence was caused by these groups, either by the State Department or by independent Indian scholarship. The rise of Hindu nationalism as a whole was viewed indulgently, partly because of its anti-communism and its eager cultivation of big business, as well as its strong presence in the US diaspora. Um, I, how am I doing? Five minutes, right, okay. So, um, <clears throat> my second category, media. The relation of this term to the Cold War has largely centered in the question of propaganda, pro or anti-communist. But a more important development that took place during the Cold War has largely been ignored, namely the intensive promotion of the instruments of propaganda, namely mass media. Instead of being treated as agencies of the state, they were proclaimed as emblems and agents of freedom and as enemies of authoritarianism. Here, media are seen as, or should be understood as, receptacles of modern subjectivity from the print revolution onwards, <clears throat> but not considered investigating, worth investigating on their own. Or, to put it another way, they were also phenomena that disappeared into their concepts, which in turn telescoped into idealized understandings of modern society. Similarly, we might say, the question of religion, and with it, of religious difference, disappeared into what was the presiding term, namely secularism, which was considered a fait accompli, rather than being a precarious fiction maintained between church and state that could not withstand close examination. <clears throat> so to my task of comparison, very briefly, and uh, 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 abbreviatedly, I suggest that uh, uh, it's obvious the United States is also a post-colonial society. Uh, it was, after all, the per first post-colonial society, and it's useful to consider what this, uh, uh, to undertake the task of comparison, not from the U.S. outwards, as is typically done, from the outside inwards, uh, what we can learn from, from such a comparison. Uh, thus, it is in the global periphery that one, one can appreciate more recently, uh, uh, more easily, the recency of secularism as a policy and its relatively weak hold on society. And we, we can recall here that the U.S. is in fact distinct from Western Europe in that its political revolution was not achieved as a freedom from religion, but a freedom for religion. Yeah, and in this sense, it is symptomatic of many other colonies, not all, but certainly of India. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and Hannah Arendt has made this remark that for all the importance and brilliance of the American Revolution, its founders, once the revolution was accomplished, turned their backs on the rest of the world and focused on building their republic to the detriment, certainly, of political theory and political history. Yeah? Uh, but with this recent uh, appearance of a return to isolationism um, that we seem to be witnessing here, together with the de uh, deliberate uh, blurring of perception and reality, uh, we can consider at least three uh, interrelated transvaluations that are going on. I'll go as far as I can in this, the time I have. First, values are exercised as claims which can stand for facts the adequacy of their representation is not challenged. In fact, uh, uh, it doesn't appear even to get taken as an issue that requires to be discussed. Coherent logic, as was mentioned yesterday, is not necessarily an issue in fascist doctrine. Second, the Habesian social contract, usually held to underwrite the modern era, which relegates differences of religion to the private sphere, is rejected here. Now, Hobbes had sought to replace the fact of political conquest with the rule of law, right? So in England, the Norman conquest was being replaced by the rule of law uh, with his uh, argument about a social contract. But what we have with recent events is a return to 
what Michel Foucault has called the social war discourse. Yeah, the social war discourse replaces a rule of law discourse. Yeah. Third, the Westphalian peace, which upholds the principle of cuius regio, eius religio, whose realm, his religion, thus of national sovereignty, signaled the end of the era of total war. And this is, of course, linked to the Hobbesian social contract. Our contemporary reaction claims to want to end this more than 300-year-old pact and return to the era of total war, where politics and morality are fused together, just as during the medieval crusades. Now, all of this adds up to a very tall order indeed, more than what was presented in Trump's campaign pledges, certainly, and probably more, maybe we can close this door, probably more than the majority of his electorate bargained for. Since they go together with promises of more jobs and deal-making with foreign countries that will make America great again, they are also, as Robert Kuttner has remarked, all over the map. They do not survive close inspection, but their power lies more in disruption than in reconstruction. We essentially appear to have high-impact narratives that look like they might have been shaped in Hollywood. Um, I wrote this before, but uh, paper, one of the papers yesterday, Jeff Alexander, uh, uh, dealt with an argument like this. We are dealing with high-impact narratives that might have been shaped in Hollywood and pre-tested in one or other segment of the entertainment industry, such as gaming, which, of course, Steve Bannon worked in. The power of these narratives is measured by their success in the attention economy, which bypasses the liberal model of the public sphere. Truth does not correct error so much as decline in relevance as the quality of information circulating increases. A new addendum to the parliamentary model, namely ratings, alters the nature of public debate in ways that tend to favor free riders, outsiders, and disruptors over those subscribing to institutional reproduction. This is a reminder that the evolution of what Hans Magnus Enzensberger called the consciousness industry has, not surprisingly, implied an enormous political power, one that was assumed to be safely sequestered in an extension of the separation of powers argued for by Montesquieu and later by the Federalist Papers, with the assumption that there would be a fourth estate that would counterbalance the government, but which would itself stay in its place, was akin to a kind of religious belief in the power of institutions that would simply reproduce themselves as they were made. Now, in mass-mediated environments, the imagination of consensus is magnified, manifold, and thus the shock of an attack on the values of a system has an explosive impact. Paul Virilio thus spoke of an information bomb capable of going where other explosives had never been able to go, into people's minds and thus into everything they perceive. Contemporary right-wing theorization of the media, saturated as it is with the discourse of total war, has, largely because of its pariah status, been far more adept <coughs> at designing itself as something like an information bomb, or to switch the metaphor as a contagion, as information you feel you need to protect yourself, but in fact it attacks your immune system. The real defense would be then to exclude its circulation altogether, but only the enemies of liberal democracy were supposed to undertake censorship. So this is the kind of dilemma we're left with, and I have to wrap up, so thank you very much. Well, I'm very happy to, uh, to be here. Uh, and basically, uh, I think given the topic of the conference and the current anxieties about uh, what's going on right now, uh, some of the questions of the conference apply to the reality that we live, I think, every minute. Uh, and let's say from the academic side, this is done in a context 
Where, that, where now there is a, 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 you know, a very important interest on issues like uh, populism, fascism, racism, uh, and it's quite understandable. I mean, it's quite understandable. Uh, and to the extent that this conference can even re-energize that interest, I mean, moving from, let's say, a state of melancholia or even anxiety to, uh, to a state in which the academy can provide some sort of understanding of what's going on, not a response, not an answer of what these guys going to do or not. We don't know that. We are surprised every minute about uh, you know whether what he writes or what he decides with important and even traumatic consequences for a lot of people, probably not us, uh, uh, but uh, or not many of us, uh, or perhaps you know in the future some of us. Who knows? So basically, this we are talking about a topic uh, that has in the current situation, at least in this country. Uh, a kind of uh, emergency status. And thereby, there is an, a kind of understanding uh, that we should have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the frustration, I mean, among many of us, or even the public at large, when we speak and we don't provide an answer of what's going on uh, with the world, and especially in America, and especially with the caudillo that we have currently at the White House. Now, I, like all the specialists that talk to you in this conference, and I learn a lot myself from them, I come to talk basically as an expert on this topic. It's not that I became yesterday an expert on fascism and populism. It's not that I became yesterday an expert on this because of Donald J. Trump. In fact, this is, I'm very happy to say, my book number six on the topic. Um, and it came in a, in a moment uh, which... Uh, which demands explanations that I think, uh, as scholars and certainly as historians, we cannot provide. And yet, uh, I think moments like this uh, basically show why we need history. So my simple message to my colleagues out there that are becoming now experts on the topic, I have a very simple message. Do what we did, do your homework, and read history. And I don't mean just study the historical record, but just read the incredible amount of, of, of works uh, on the subject. I mean, that is the starting point. I mean, it's not that they will give you an answer, but then you will see, okay, I see something new here, and yet I see important presence for thinking what's going on. Now, starting with that, uh, I will say this. Uh, as an historian, I am quite frustrated with the bibliography. That's why I wrote this book. I mean, with the subtitle, In History. Because I felt that these two topics, fascism and populism, were analyzed to a great extent theoretically, being in the sense that they were combined in the analysis, and not so much historically. My, many of my colleagues were studying one or the other, and they were not combining them, and uh, perhaps because of their own frustration with the lack of history in the theory, they did not... Uh, pay too much attention to the theory itself. And there is something to be gained. Why not going out and, you know, engage in other disciplines? So basically my project was about, or is about, trying to see what happens when history and theory meet. And what and how, actually, in this current state, uh, not yet of emergency in the legal sense, but a state of emergency in every other sense. Um, what happens, I mean, and what kind of uh, interpretation can be provided and to understand what's going on. Now, from the theoretical side, then, I will, I will be somehow hyperbolic and probably unfair, but I will say that uh, there are a lot of theories, even definitions of both fascism and populism without history. And what I mean by that is that when you approach this from a historical perspective, and this is, you know, our students are many times frustrated by this, because we insist things are complex, they cannot be killed or determined by two or three or four sentences in a definition. And then the students said, say to us, okay, give us your definition. And we say, no, the problem is that, you know, there are continuities and changes, and it's very hard to really... Uh, um, uh, reduce uh, uh, very complex histories which are both national and transnational to a kind of one minute explanation. I mean, that is, I, I think that will sum up what I think. I mean, and many of my historians' colleagues think. And yet, our emphasis on the history connects to the particular thing that when you study the history of this phenomena, basically you see that first they are combined, they are part of the same 
let's say, to put it in terms of Ezeb Sternhel's major work on both fascism and the Enlightenment, they are part of the same response, broad response, to modern democracy. But these are responses which are often connected, often synchronic. As we speak now, they are even part of power coalitions. And yet, they are very different, meaning that a populist is not a fascist. They can be allies, and yet it's not the same. And in fact, also chronologically, it is one that emerges before the other. I mean, it is populism that first comes as a response to problems in, in, in modern democracy, or what they see as problems in modern democracy. And then fascism, in a way, learning from that master, so to speak, uh, uh, you know, appears with a very different response. Very different response. And then after that, populism comes back. And that, but by after that, I mean 1945, when fascism is defeated. I will be a little bit more specific about, about some historical record here, but I just want to provide a kind of spectrum for, for a second. And, and finally, the current situation, in which it seems, and to, I mean, and that sense of it seems actually, I think, cannot be just discarded, it seems that fascism is coming back. So this is a long history of, let's say, modern responses to modern democracy. The first responses are, as I said, a, you know, I will say sorry to my particularly American or Russian history colleagues that study populism in the 19th century, they are not that important. Why? I mean, why? Because they were not in power and they were opposition movements. So in a way, you might say that in the form of a modern response to modern democracy, populism was not successful by the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Other more classical responses happened to democracy, for example, colonization, dictatorship, many other things, but not populism. Perhaps it was, as they say, young and inexperienced then. And fascism appears. By the, light, by the 1920s. And of course, it learns from the populist experience. Who can deny that this majoral candidate, who actually, in a way, arrived to power as the mayor of Vienna, Karl Lueger, but, and, uh, uh, who could, could deny that that was a, an influence for Hitler? But what is interesting is that Lueger was a populist in the opposition, but when he was a major, all the anti-Semitic stuff that he said, which was at the center of his campaign, was not that important. So in a way, that is a case of somebody coming to power and ceasing to be populist, which is interesting because all the time we are basically being fed with these essential arguments about who are you, a populist, and a fascist, and all, all, all people change, and somebody who is a populist can turn into a fascist, and vice versa. It's not an existential condition, it's how you practice politics in the opposition and in power. And then the, we are studying these uh, topics, I think, in, in a context of extreme abuse of the concepts, of the terms, especially populism. Populism by what I would call anti-populist. I mean, let me be explicit here. Never voted for a populist candidate, nor I think I will. But I don't consider myself an anti-populist. I mean, I'm trying to study basically why people like this, which I don't like. But I'm not an anti-populist. I don't demonize that. I mean, uh, and the point is that in terms of demonization, people like, I mean, politicians like the President of Mexico, Peña Nieto, or former Prime Minister of Britain, uh, Tony Blair, tend to identify populism with whatever they don't like, but and by that what they mean is whatever is against neoliberalism or the status quo that they believe they represent. So that is a kind of, whenever they, talk, they are talking about the populist, is everything that is not Tony Blair or uh, Enrique Peña Nieto. Now, I was wondering, having studied the fascists for a long time, well, how were the fascists responding to this? And we saw, I, I think everybody saw that incredible Vice documentary, right, uh, on, on Charlottesville. And one guy, who actually is a Trump supporter, or is a supporter of this broad coalition between populism and fascism in America, said, yeah, but Trump, I, there is a problem with Trump, because he, his daughter is with a Jewish person. So, which is to say, he's not anti-Semitic or fascist enough for me. That's, you know, uh, you know, an expert like me will say, well, that's what this guy is saying. And, and it's not that original. I was in Argentina a couple of weeks ago, and I went, I'm, I'm one of those guys, actually, and I don't know what they think of me, but I went to the, to the kiosk, to the newspaper stand, and I bought this fascist magazine. And they say, 
Somebody has to say the truth, it says. They are all populists and neoliberals. So here, unlike Blair or Peña Nieto, all the populists are the non-fascists, according to the fascist view. And yet, the fascists, as the, we saw in that documentary, they can be tolerant to some extent of a populist racist in power. And actually, that's preferable to them than other choices. Um, now, the point is that there is a history behind this. And the point is that we need to understand this history as a global history. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is that uh, in terms of the abuses of the term, of both the terms fascism and populism, and the understanding of populism in history, we need to really go beyond our own countries or our own places that, that we study. Because, for example, my colleagues studying Italy or France, uh, no, nobody that is here, by the way, but I read some colleagues saying, we need to go back to the 1980s in order to understand this connection between populism and neo-fascism, or to put it differently, the moment in which the neo-fascists become populist. And that is totally correct if you just study France and Italy. But the question is, when you study the history in broader terms, you will see that in other places in the world, the populists, the fascists turn into populists before. Why? Because of different contexts. It would have been unthinkable to do, in the, to do that in the anti-fascist context of, an, of a country like Italy or even current Germany. It was possible, for example, to do so, and that is what happened, in Latin America. Okay. I have to disclose, this is what I study, that's why I know the story, I mean, basically. It's not that I'm defending my field, but this is what I happen to know, that actually happened before than in France or Italy. I mean, this transition from fascism as a contestation of democracy that destroys democracy from within, by the way, as you know. They win elections, they destroy democracy. To a very different situation in countries like Brazil and Argentina, where you had dictators that after 1945, although they like Fascism, uh, the guy from my country, uh, Juan Domingo Perón, also liked anti-Semitism and other forms of racism, but he was also a politician, a very smart one, and by 1945 he decided that instead of destroying democracy from within, in fact he was a dictator, he was a strong man in a dictatorship, he would create a democracy out of dictatorship. So the opposite historical direction. Now, it's a good reading of the times. I mean, this is the Cold War, and he actually thinks that, a pop, a, 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 you know, a, let's say, an ideology that is clearly, clearly against a liberal democracy cannot be legitimate enough in the, post, in the, in the new early Cold War. Uh, so his fascist stance, I mean, he's in power, he sees that it will not be successful. He already sees how, for example, Franco in, the, in these early times is being surrounded. And, and, and if you read the papers, by the way, 1944, uh, in, in, in the, at least in the countries that I read them, in Europe or Latin America or in the States, everybody is talking that Franco, for example, is going. And this is what Perón is thinking, actually. So the, the point is that he, like Vargas and people, and also other leaders in Bolivia and countries like Venezuela, in a context in which fascism was not defeated, they believe that they can recuperate some authoritarian patterns of fascism for the new world that emerges after 1945. Now, why this is important? For me, it's important because I'm Latin American. This is part, you know, of the history I study, the, the history that affects my life in many ways, and so on and so forth. But this is important, I think, for all of us, because we, we uh, particularly those that are, we, that are concerned about Trump today, is that these are the only precedents of populism in power. So you have to go to the 1940s and 1950s to see the earlier instances of what happens when a populist is in power. And you don't learn that by, um, by studying what, you know, the recent French elections or other things. I mean, you don't learn that. You, I mean, the mode of, of learning is about populism in the opposition, which is in the fantastic position of denouncing everything as the elite and talking for the people. This is one of the basic definitions of populism that says a lot, and yet historically says nothing. Um, so basically, this is important, I think, to, you know, to think populism in terms of its broader history. This is what, kind of what I'm doing in this, in this book, and, and I would not like to kill my book in the probably 10 minutes that I have, but uh, I mean, reduce it to, to basically 10 minutes. But I have to say that that is one of my main arguments. And, 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 a, and a kind of outcome, not the premise of that argument, not the premise at all, but an outcome of that argument is that we have to be less US-centered and less Euro-centered to understand the history of populism. 
And it's not really the premise. It's not that I start uh, on this because this is my field. And I want to show my uh, Americanist colleagues or, Euro or Euro European history colleagues how important it is to know about my region. I mean, that's not really the point, although, of course, I empathize with that point, but this is not my point. It's, the, my point is an outcome of my historical investigation. And basically, uh, that's why it's important to understand this in history as a regime. Because, I mean, it's, it's interesting how it happens. I mean, and in a way, uh, with probably my rationale or perhaps yours, it's very difficult to understand. I mean, how something which is clearly contradictory. I mean, if you, if you are not in power, I mean, are you not an elite? Are you really now being the one being uh, somehow um, overpowered by those in power? How do you explain that? And there are precedents of how do you explain that. And in most cases, actually, the idea is to push a further polarization. Yes, we are in power, and we, so, we see this in, in Poland, and we see in, in many, uh, this in many countries. So the idea, uh, surprisingly enough, and, and we know that this is the history in most cases, is that they choose to go uh, in the direction of polar polarization. And what they do with this, uh, with this situation is then to explain that although they are in power, they are more powerful enemies that you don't even can uh, defeat, even if you are in power. So this is the idea. And that's why in all these histories we see, not in the definition, but in the histories, the, the, there is a kind of shared concern about the so-called enemies of the people. The president of the US was, was not the, pres the, the first to use this, uh, this conception. And, and, and I'm pretty sure this, that he's, uh, he's very much an interest in the history of the phenomenon that he now represents. So what is interesting is how symptomatic this is of a larger history of a contestation of democracy. So, clearly, what I'm saying is that populism relies on enemies, clearly. Uh, it's not that, it, that a populist cannot, uh, you know, what happens when a populist uh, is not relying on, this, on, on, the centrality, on the centrality of the enemy? Well, I would say historically that probably he's ceasing to be or acting in populist ways. And this could have happened. Uh, you know, when Trump won the election, and yet we have the carnage, carnage speech in which he basically def defined uh, his new administration as one that will be actually uh, in a, uh, providing a sense of continuity with the campaign. And the campaign, I mean, and this is, you know, basically I said this, I mean, in my book when I finished, I had to finish it, I wanted to finish it, and I said, okay, I will, uh, I will restrict myself to analysis of the campaign, not really true. I kind of incorporated some, some further speeches, including this description of the, uh, of the press as the en enemy of the people. But the, the truth of the matter is that I think, you know, it will not be a stretch, I mean, to say that historically, at least from my perspective, it was a clearly racist campaign. Nothing new in the history of populism. I mean, there is a basic distinction be between populism on the right and the left. They all talk of the people as, in fact, those people that like them and vote for them. So the majority of citizens is somehow translated, transformed, into those that follow the leader. Another European, uh, in a way, myopia is that because they, are not, they don't have strong leaders in, the, in, the, in some opposition European uh, movements, populist movements, they say the leader is not important to populism. Well, I would say it's an incomplete form of populism. It's in the making. So you need leaders for this formation. And, when they, when, and, and then the second translation. So the people, who are the people? In this case, the 30 percent, more or less, that voted for Trump, those people become, in fact, the American people. And in a way, Trump is ruling for them. Now, the second instance is, of course, because, as he actually said, and this is, you know, he's not the first in saying this, is that he's the messenger of the people. He's the one that speaks for the people, the people that cannot speak. Second translation. So in fact, in practice, the people are the leader. So the leader somehow embodies the people, and it's through him that the people talk. And it's another form of, the, of consultation that is not democratic at all. Because in fact, insofar as he knows what the people think, he doesn't need to ask anyone what the people want. Thereby, it is what he wants. And that's how he rules. Now, he does that in a context in which he relies on electoral legitimacy. And that is why populism is both democratic and undemocratic at the same time. It is a form of authoritarian democracy. So populism relies on electoral legitimacy. Big difference with fascism. Now, finally, to finish, probably I have two minutes, uh, I will say. Okay. So to finish, I will say this. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the topic is 
How central democracy is to populism? It is central. It's a form of legitimacy. But what they want is an illiberal democracy. It is a democracy that uh, relies on formal elections, which they need to win, and, and, and basically no other instances of democracy, meaning a really critical and lively public sphere, an independent press, and the separation of powers. That is not important. So it's a kind of twisted form of democracy, as my colleague Nadia Urbinati said, a kind of disfiguration of what democracy is. But it's not fascism, which means the elimination of democracy. Now, racism. Racism, is, racism, as you know, I will not talk about this, is central to fascism. One way or the other, I didn't find in history a single case of fascism in which racism or an ethnic notion of, of the people is not important. And not only in the sense of uh, the definition of the enemy, but also in the specific sense of excluding the enemy from citizenship when they are in power. So populism doesn't do that. Populism demonizes the, the enemy on a rhetorical level, but we still can vote, right? We might not be the people, but we still can vote. And our role is important in a populist regime because we demonstrate that we are the constant losers. Now, what populism does, and this is what, what, what I don't know, and I can tell you some precedents, uh, what populism does when actually loses an election. It can cease to be populist, and I think this is what we are observing now in Turkey and Venezuela, and just relying on more dictatorial forms of government. I mean, they are not winning elections. I mean, in Venezuela, Turkey is a different story, but in Venezuela, they are in, unable to win free elections. So basically, it's, you know, they are going in the direction of dictatorship, uh, but most populists in history don't do that. They just lose elections and they try to win the following one. And that's what basically happens. But what is interesting is that populism, and this is probably the last two things I would like to say, populism is, after 1945, when it becomes for the first time a regime in so many Latin American countries, uh, some of them I describe, basically it involves a, three, uh, a threefold renunciation. It involves a renunciation of fascism, which, is some, which in some cases, such as Perón in Argentina, is personal. He likes fascism. He just doesn't think that it's possible. Uh, a renunciation of racism. Racism is too attached to the violence of the Second World War. And basically, it doesn't work. And in fact, Perón, uh, uh, Perón and this is interesting, Perón, uh, he, Perón had a problem with the Jewish Umbrella Organization. Why? Because they were the Jewish Umbrella Organization. But what did he do, unlike Hitler? He created a Peronist Jewish organization and invited all, all, all Argentine Jews to be part of that. So you can be whatever you want, but you, be, you want to be, or you need to be Peronist, or populist in this case. The other renunciation is political violence. In fact, you know, if you want to talk about my country, all the dictatorships that we have, and even other civilian governments, were much more violent than the Peronist regime. And finally, uh, well, I, I basically, I think I said this, the, the three. So the renunciation of racism. And to end, what I think is a novelty about transpopulisms is that although we saw this ethnic conception of the people which defined the political enemies as non-member of, of, let's say, of the same uh, phenotypical group. I mean, this is typical in Europe. Not much in Latin America, by the way. In Latin America, left and right populism, they are just not much, of, they are not racist. Whereas in Europe we see this in the opposition, and we never saw, as far as I know, in history, a case in which populism, again, tries to approach fascism, which means a renunciation of, I mean, of the novelty of its form of politics. So basically what we have here today, and I don't know what is going to happen, obviously, is a novelty in the sense that we have for the first time a populism in power that, go back, that goes back to a central tenet of fascism. It's not fascist yet, I don't think it will be, but who, who am I to know the future? Historians, we are really bad for you know, anticipating what is going to happen. But the point here is that we have a, a, a form of populism that, as far as I can tell, is the closest to fascism in power that we have in the history of populism. So I will finish with that thought. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, all three of you, so much.